Good evening and welcome to News 360 from the News Hub here in Accra. I am Misa Moni. And I am Portia Gabo. Coming up the headlines. Seven children engaged in child labor rescued in Krachel West District, a major destination for child trafficking in the country. Torrential rains destroy all essential drugs and items at the Bacando Chips compound in Sekendi, Takrade Metropolis. In the Ashanti region, journalists of Ghana's leading media organization, Media General, sweeps seven awards at the maiden GJA Ashanti Media Awards in Kumasi. And on the international front, U.S. President Donald Trump throws his weight behind Boris Johnson for Conservative Party leadership. We have details coming up shortly. Do stay with us. And Krachi West District has been identified as a major destination for child trafficking and child labor. Our reporter, Peter Kwadato, who joined a study tour by the Center for Human Rights, Conflict and Peace Studies at the University of Education in Winneba, to the district reports seven child laborers Seven child laborers were rescued within a spate of two hours in the lake. Human trafficking is a global problem affecting millions of people and many countries. In Ghana, the internal trafficking of children into hazardous jobs is a major challenge. Many Ghanaian children are trafficked from their home villages to work in the fishing industry. Fishers desperate to sustain their income exploit these kids living in abject poverty to work for long hours. However, statistics on the number of children in what many refer to as modern-day slavery remain scanty and often debatable. A recent assessment conducted by the International Justice Mission found that 57.6% of children working on southern Lake Volta's waters were trafficked. The report further identified majority of the lake's child laborers are too young to legally conduct the hazardous tax inherent in many aspects of the fishing industry. At least one out of five children identified in the lake fishing were six years old or younger, according to the report. A recent documentary produced by CNN on the lake further corroborated this assertion. However, these reports were met with mixed reaction, especially from policymakers. The development prompted the Center for Human Rights, Conflict and Peace at the University of Education, Winneba, to go for a fact-finding mission at Ketikrache, where the practice is reportedly rife. The university study team encountered a number of children involved in the hazardous labor within two hours of cruising on the lake. Some of the child laborers aged between 8 and 12 years were working without supervision, whilst others appeared more nourished. This prompted the group, with support from Pakodep, a local NGO, to rescue seven of those encountered between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. But this was not without a struggle. They claimed the children had been enrolled in school, but could not explain why they were found on the lake engaged in fishing activities during school hours on Friday. This particular child went on his knees, crying and begging the team not to take him away from fishing. The team proceeded to Ogeche, one of the island communities where three of the seven rescued children came from. There's a basic school with an acceptable number of teachers. However, most parents prioritize fishing ahead of their wars education. I was touched. I shed tears. Because I have this six-year-old girl that I always supervise to do uh, one or two things. So to leave a child as young as five, to be on the lake all in the name of going to help a master. I don't know how best that child can be of help to the master. The issue of poverty is, 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 is very, very critical. And I'm sure if this important element is not tackled, the issue of uh, trafficking in the country will, will continue. The statistics from the Krachi West District Social Works are staggering, requiring pragmatic action. It's very true. 
that child trafficking is very, very, very rampant on the lake water in the district. In fact, our district is serving as a transit point for the traffickers. They bring them from down south to the Karachi district and distribute it to other islands in the district. It has come to be, be with us. So therefore, I think everybody in this country, from top to down, we must all accept that, yes, of course, the issue exists. And therefore, we must find the root cause. Ghana is the first country to have uh, ratified the uh, Convention on uh, the Right of uh, the Child. So we have to ensure that if we are the first to ratify that, we should be the first to end it. So if we are not ending that, it simply means that the state uh, is irresponsible. An irresponsible state obviously leads to a decayed uh, state. Human rights watchers say Ghana may not attain most of the sustainable development goals if pragmatic steps are not taken to address the widespread child trafficking and child labor. I, I think we have a long way to go. In theory, we can say yes, but in practice, no. And even the politicians will agree with me that in practice, no, we have a long way to go. When you look at the sustainable development goals, I mean, education for all, eradication of poverty, how do we achieve these sustainable development goals with the kind of conditions we see these children in? These children are living in a vicious cycle of exploitation. This exploitative act, unless checked and eliminated, attaining SDGs 1, 2, 3, 4 and 8 that seek to ensure no poverty, no hunger, good health, quality education, as well as good jobs and economic growth will continue to elude the country. Because they are going to be exploited all their lives and they will have no choice than to become slave masters that would also exploit other children and so far as children in this part of the country are concerned, you can never guarantee any you know, bright future for them. The rescued children are currently at Village of Life, a caregiving home and educational facility for rescued child laborers beginning a new life journey with 98 other inmates. Let's now go to the western region where four hours of torrential rains have destroyed all essential drugs and items at a chips compound at Bakado, a suburb of Esikado Ketan in the Sekendi Takwadi metropolis. Meanwhile, residents in the community are also counting their losses after property running into thousands of cities were destroyed by the flood. Torrential rains, which began Friday, swept through the chips compound. The rainwater, which was at window level, entered the consulting room, ward, and the waiting area. In the process, a freezer storing essential drugs fell into the water and spilled all content. Essential drugs, including injectables, were all affected. Other drugs stored in the consulting room were also not spared. A nurse at the CHIPS compound, Portia Echampon, added folders of all their patients have been lost to the flood waters. We've lost everything, such as our um, scale, weighing skills, even our fridge that we store our vaccines inside, it has spoiled, including our weighing cards, our standing scale, our weighings, our reports. Affected residents had spread their items, including personal effects, burdens, and other home appliances on the main street. They blamed their predicament on this train, which, according to them, was poorly constructed. The residents, who were very angry, charged on the Western Region Minister, Kobi Otridako Mensa, and his entourage, who had come to sympathize with them. According to the residents, city authorities are already aware of the challenges of the community and want solutions and not sympathy. They threatened not to vote in the next election. <laughs> Nevertheless, the regional minister, Kobi Otreda Kumensa, assured them that the perennial challenge will be addressed once and for all. And teachers at the Fancy AEDA Basic School in the Aguna East District of the Central Region are calling on authorities to speed up work on an abandoned teachers' quarters. They lament the absence of accommodation for teachers in the community remains a challenge to their work as some commute long distances to school daily. 
do see Ayamila has more. The Ofuasi AED basic school currently has about eight teachers who handle both the primary and the JHS school. Accommodation for teachers here remain a challenge, retarding the progress of the school. Storerooms of the kindergarten block have been converted into living rooms for some teachers. They complain living in the storerooms comes with some difficulties. There are a lot of reptiles around because the room is near to the bush. So this Saturday I just killed two snake lizards in my room and I've been seeing a lot of insects, a lot. Some will be jumping from your food and all that. It's not easy staying in this place, but just that the people are very good. They are nice to us, that's why we are coping. Others have no choice than to commute three miles to school every day. Teachers say they spend their salaries on transport, a situation affecting their finances. In the face of these challenges, a nine-room teacher's quarters project almost at completion stage has been abandoned. This building you are seeing behind me is supposed to be the teacher's quarters for the Ofuasi AEDA basic school here in the central region. Information I've gathered indicates the project was started 10 years ago but has been abandoned by the contractor due to lack of funds to complete the project. The distance from here to the junction is about three miles and the teachers cannot walk such a distance to school every day. For that matter, we are calling the government to speed up in the completing this building for the teachers. Although many teachers have applied for transfers from the school, the few left are hopeful the completion of the project could change the narrative. Lucy Ayambila, TV3 News. And here in Accra, construction of major roads linking three electoral areas in the Ablukuma West municipality is set to commence Monday, June 3. This was after a protest by residents on the deteriorating nature of roads in the area. Member of Parliament, Esla also Ekofol, however warned, structures cited along roads would be demolished. In March this year, commercial drivers and some residents in the newly created Ablekuma West municipality took to the street to register their displeasure about the poor nature of roads and their adverse effects on the socio-economic development of the area. Major roads linking adjoining communities are not hard, have developed potholes and makes commuting discomforting, especially when it rains. Where affected streets include the Tunga streets, Botwe, Shienyo streets, and the Western Link Road. Motorists always run at a loss as a chunk of their daily earnings go into purchasing of spare parts. From run about to last stop, but mm. that road is good. All the road uh, blend left and both and right is not good at all. Government has awarded contracts for the construction of some of these roads in poor states. Member of Parliament for Ablikma West, Esla Owusu, who is also the Minister for Communications, cut short for the takeoff of the project, which include construction of a 2.9 kilometer road on one stretch and another 12 kilometer asphaltic overlay on another with culverts. Another 25 kilometer asphaltic work pending government approval has also been scheduled to be executed by the contractor. Oswald's constructions as parts of the contract. Madam Esla Owusu said the project, being facilitated by the Ministry of Roads and Highways, has enough funding to ensure swift completion of the work. She have warned structures cited illegally would not be spared. Further down this road, you see that there's a wall that is projecting onto the road. That has to go. Wherever they have to construct the road, if there's any structure in the um, reservation way, it would have to make way for the road. She said all roads cannot be constructed at the same time, owing limited funds, hinting of provision of street lights. In addition to the roads, another challenge is street lights, and we are going to do that as well. Municipal roads engineer Theophilus Queno explained other components of the project. With this road, we'll do gravel works, we'll do drains, we'll do curb work, then we'll do the surfacing work. Then with the asphalt overlay, that will take care of the existing roads that we have. And we have a lot of portal reading roads that we have to repair. So we'll repair the portals and we'll put the asphalt overlay. 
The projects are expected to be completed within six months. Let's move across to the Volta region and there, a group calling itself Coalition of Healthcare Delivery Monitors are demanding an immediate revamp of the National Health Insurance Scheme. The coalition, which embarked on a demonstration, alleged the scheme was no longer functioning in the Volta region. Here's a report by Robert Abilba. The demonstrators were clad in red colors, carried placards, some of which read, we now pay for drugs covered by NHIS. NHIS is not working in Volta region. Nana, pay for NHIS claims on time. We are dying. NHIS is now cash and carry, amongst others. They paraded the principal streets of Ho amidst drumming, singing and dancing. <laughs> Tune of brass band music in spite of heavy rains. They later converged at the Infolio Park to be addressed by their leaders who focused on challenges of the National Health Insurance Scheme. Subscribers of the scheme complained of poor health service following the inability of government to settle health facilities in the region. Away from the Volta region, preterm babies at the neonatal intensive unit of the Tamale Teaching Hospital are paired in incubators. Senior pediatrician at the unit, Abdul Mumin, said newborn babies risk contracting cross infection. A report by Stanley Niblo. The Tamale Teaching Hospital remains the premier health facility in the northern part of the country. As a major referral center, the hospital annually admits more than 50,000 patients. The neonatal intensive care unit plays an essential role in the survival of newborn babies through the use of infant incubators. Last year, the unit admitted a total of 2,300 babies, with 30% being preterm babies. 20% of babies admitted at the facility also weigh below 2.5 kilograms. As at the first quarter of this year, the neonatal intensive care unit has 850 admissions, with 250 being preterm babies. However, neonates are paired in incubators that are meant for one because they are not enough. This according to the senior pediatrician at the neonatal intensive care unit, Abdul Mumin, impacts negatively on the health of neonates. For the babies that we pair, the risk of infection is higher. So if we get more incubators just for the time of stabilization, we get to keep every baby in their own incubator. That reduces the risk of cross-infection. Kokroko Charity Foundation has meanwhile presented two Draga branded infant incubators to the unit after a first one in 2016. The neonatal intensive care unit of the Tamale Teaching Hospital has received two incubators. This has brought the total number of incubators to 13, but authorities say they will need 20 more so they would be able to cater for the number of preterm babies that come to the facility to receive further care. 2016 Ghana Journalist of the Year, Kwame Sifakai who is also the founder of Kokroko Charity Foundation, says the foundation is determined to save lives of newborn babies. We are doing our best to give as many as we can, and um, we're hoping that we'll put smiles on the faces of mothers, give hope to mothers, give a life to a child, and uh, just impact our health delivery system in Ghana. The incubators are among 10 donated to health facilities in the Northern Belt. Kwame Sifaka indicated the gesture is not politically motivated. The Tamale Teaching Hospital also requires resources to address other concerns. <laughs> Roof of the corridor of the obstetric department close to the administration block is bat infested. A source at the hospital said recent fumigation has not solved the issues. Racks have been used to improvise but that has not also helped much. Stanley Niblew, TV3 News, Tamale, Northern Region. Well, it looks like the Chairman General is going to be the grandpapa of many babies. Keep it up, Chairman. Now, journalists of Ghana's leading media organization, Media General, won seven awards at the Maiden GJA Ashanti Media Awards in Kumasi. The journalists who have been churning out compelling development-oriented stories were on it for impactful stories. 
Broadcast journalist Beatrice Pio Gabra, who was the only female among 21 journalists shortlisted, won in two categories, Best Health Reporting and Best HIV and AIDS Reporting, while Ibrahim Abubakar emerged the best journalist in TV feature, with Benjamin Edu receiving the Best Journalist in Sports Reporting Award. Ibrahim was also adjudged the second best journalist in agriculture reporting and again the second best journalist in SME reporting. Benjamin Edu also received the award for the second best journalist in culture and tourism reporting. Media General Bureau Chief for the Northern Sector, Kofi Edu Domfe, was honored for exemplary and inspiring journalism. Chairman of the National Media Commission chastised some journalists for misinforming the public. The National Media Commission is marshalling all resources to ensure integrity in the profession. We have an image we have an integrity and we must maintain it because the relationship between us and the public is not bought, it's trust. When we lose the trust, we will forfeit them and that will be very, very dangerous. Regional Chairman of the GJA, Kingsley Hope, touched on the need for journalists to champion the fight against climate change. We need to fight the negative effects of climate change which is a significant challenge to achieving sustainable development and threatens to drag millions of people into climate poverty. Director of the Forest Research Institute of Ghana, Dr. Daniel Enin Ofori, emphasized the significant role journalists play in ensuring environmental sustainability. President of the Ghana Journalists Association, Dr. Roland Afilmoni, stated as part of its 70th anniversary, the GJA will launch a war on sanitation. Our foremost agenda is to repurpose journalism. This will mean moving journalism, moving the paradigm from the obsessive and compulsive politics to journalism which will sharpen its focus on social ills like sanitation, water, roads, social infrastructure. We have surplus of politics and deficits. Other media houses and personalities received awards for their contribution to journalism in the region. So congratulations to Kofi, Ben, Ibrahim, and Beatrice for giving us awards at the GG. All right. Keep it up, guys, for making us proud. Congratulations again. So what was your story of the week? Well, this week has been very eventful with a number of key newsworthy developments across the country. There has been the story of flooding, mostly in the national capital, Accra, the strike by the mortuary workers and its impact among others. But as the week comes to a close, we put the spotlight on major steps taken this week by stakeholders to end partisan vigilantism. Coming up as a news report on what happened during the week. Political party vigilantism, although not a new trend, has become a topical conversation since the Ayawaso West War gone by election in January this year. Following the disturbances during the controversial polls, a commission was set up by President Ekufuado, chaired by former Shiraj boss Emil Short. After weeks of sittings, the Emil Short Commission submitted its report to government. Subsequently, the Attorney General's Department presented before Parliament the Vigilantism and Related Offences Bill. In fact, that bill is still under consideration. This week's meetings by the National Peace Council did not only bring together the two major political parties, NDC and MPP. Civil society groups, including the Center for Democratic Development and the Institute for Democratic Government, were all represented. They were given the unique opportunity to make presentations on the subject matter. The stakeholders agreed to the setting up of a committee after lengthy discussions on how to disband vigilante groups. A member of the National Peace Council, Dr. S.K.B. Asante, stated that disbandment of vigilante groups would be achieved. With the support of technical experts, 
and with the inputs from the two political parties, will present a working document on a road map for the consideration of the parties. In an interview on TV3's Midday Live on Wednesday, Chairman of the National Peace Council, Most Reverend Professor Imano Asante, further assured that his outfit would be a neutral arbiter. Peace Council is only facilitating dialogue that will ensure that, you know, the, the menace of vigilantism is eliminated. It is rare to find the MPP and the NDC agree on an issue. By this time, leadership of both parties expressed strong commitment that vigilantism would not occur in the 2020 elections. General Secretary of the MPP, John Buedu, and Chairman of the NDC, Samuel Fosuampofo, spoke to a man, Daniel Opoku. Uh, it's arising out of the organization of by-elections, and I think that for us, it does not also change dramatically the composition of parliament. And maybe agree that any time any political party loses its member, either the party through its own internal process can present another candidate as, as the member of parliament. We are very much committed to this process and believe that uh, it's a threat to our, our fledging uh, democracy and uh, we need to do everything possible to keep the progress on course. While the move has been lauded, there are still questions about why government did not wait for the conclusion of this crucial deliberation before submitting the vigilantism bill before parliament. It seems almost certain that those resolutions from these meetings will not feature in the bill. But security analyst Adam Bona has a bigger concern. There has to be some amount of uh, duration. How long are we looking at ensuring that by which time uh, the, maybe the first phase of the roadmap would have been adhered to? Then we go into probably the other discussion. The technical committee agreed by the National Peace Council, MPP and NDC will in the meantime be fully established within four weeks. There is more to come on News 360. Stay with us. We'll return shortly. It's now time for Mission, and Mission is sponsored by Star Ghana Foundation with thanks to Danida, UK Aid, and the EU. Let's go to the Bono region where parents of Kofi Sua in the Doma Central Municipality have devised means to solve their school's infrastructure challenge in the face of slow response to their plights. Stanley Nibleu has more. Government introduced education in Kofi Sua in the early 90s after a pavilion was provided to shelter pupils. Since then, government has not provided infrastructure again. The growing population of the school compelled parents to improvise. Through communal labor and monthly contributions, they have been able to provide the school with a befitting office, classroom blocks for the primary pupils and the kindergarten. They have also converted the old pavilion into a complete classroom block, which now accommodates junior high pupils, while another has been built to serve as library. Parents are happy they are impacting lives. Former assemblyman for the area, Stephen Kwame Asante Kobia, is part of the mobilization team for the development. <laughs> The kindergarten structure is not spacious enough, and so the school authorities have converted the library into a classroom and now accommodated by KG pupils. The enrollment have been increased and sustained by the school feeding program. Head teacher of the school, Andrew Skufiatha, said provision of teaching and learning materials has been a concern. He's worried about the constant exploitation of pupils by parents. Because this community is a farming community, most of the parents 
do not uh, encourage their children, especially with this trend of education, to come to school. And there are some, because of financial constraint, they take their children to come and then help them to do farming work. And that's it for Mission. Mission is sponsored by Star Ghana Foundation with thanks to Danida, UK Aid and the EU. Thanks so much for watching. And now let's do some more news. Exhibitors at the second edition of the National Baby and Toddler Fair underway at the Marina Mall in Accra have lauded parents who patronize the fair for their efforts aimed at developing the minds and well-being of their wards. The fair, which is a partnership with Media General and Planet One, is given huge discounts on items, products and services on sale. The fair has everything that speaks to the needs of babies, new and expectant parents. Items on sale range from learning materials, baby wear, toys among others. Suppliers, dealers and manufacturers of baby products and services are happy to be part of the fair. As the betas express delight about turnout and the efforts of parents in developing the awards welfare. We're dealing with an educational program geared towards the development of your child's brain through books that talk and sing for them. So these are books and multimedia. So developing all of their awareness, all of their attitudes, and then all of their abilities. It's actually a good place for you to come. It brings out the exposure for people to come in and then know the varieties of the food you have. So it's very good. A lot of parents want their children to read because they realize reading helps the children to improve their grammar, you know, their writing skills, and also helps them to learn other subjects, okay? So a lot of people are encouraging their kids to read, and that is how come they come here to buy books for them. Initially, when events like this come up, you hardly see parents come here with kids, but here lies a case whereby there's been a couple of parents who come here with kids and even try to buy one or two stuff they sell, so I think it's a plus. We, those who came for mummies, aunties, daddies and uncles, um, they try to get everything else for the kids first before they come to us, yes. So I think, I think so far they are more in interested in buying the stuff for the kids and developing the kids than they are for themselves personally. With an impressive turnout and patronage, organizers are hopeful of a nationwide patronage of the fair. I want to see this fair happen in all regions. I mean, here at Connect, we are coming to Takrabi in collaboration with Connect. We will be going to Kumasi in collaboration with Akuma FM at the end of the year. So, I mean, Kumasi should watch out, um, Takrabi should also watch out, and then Tamale, Sunyani, Gota Region should also watch out. We are coming. Because we realized, as I said earlier on, there isn't any platform that brings together. And then this is a discounted fair. Patrons are assured of quality and durable products to meet their numerous expectations. So if not being at the Marina Mall where the National Baby and Toddler Fair is underway, trust me, you're missing big because this is a fair that is giving a huge discount on items on sale. There's also expert advice to new and expectant parents. And so take advantage of this very opportunity and be here. From the Marina Mall here at Accra, just screening, reporting for TV3. The Ghana Cocoa Board is optimistic of achieving its production target of 900,000 metric tons of cocoa for the 2018-2019 crop year. Director of Research Vincent Akumia says measures are in place to increase yields from the current three bags of cocoa per acre to over 20 bags per acre in the next three years. A report by Benjamin Edu. In the 2017-2018 crop season, Cocoa Board set for itself a target of producing 850 metric tons of cocoa. This target has been revised higher for the 2018-2019 cocoa season. At a deba of farmers at Antoacrum in the Amancia West District of the Ashanti region, Cocoa Board announced the closure of the cocoa season on Thursday, 30th May 2019. The Director of Research, Vincent Akomia, is confident measures put in place to increase cocoa production would help Cocoa Board meet a target for the crop year. Cocoa Board is taking steps to procure um, these slashes, um, make, make them available to farmers, especially farmers who come together as in, in groups or cooperatives. 
The forum was organized by Cocoa Board in collaboration with Agroecom Ghana Limited to reward cocoa farmers and to recognize the efforts of farmers to produce quality cocoa beans. The two institutions have over the years trained cocoa farmers on good agronomic practice to produce quality cocoa beans. Country Director of Agroecom Ghana, Mozamel Mohamudu, reiterated the company's commitment to create rural prosperity. Our focus areas is also to improve the efficiency. So this year, uh, during our premium payment process, we are also going to incorporate uh, digital premium. What kind of benefits can we give to our farmers who are receiving premium on mobile instead of receiving premium by cash? Uh, we are looking at all these interventions and we believe the future uh, is only possible when we try and accept the change that is there today. An amount of 24 million Ghana cities was announced as premium for over 700 cocoa farmers in the country. Some cocoa farmers who spoke to TV3 commended the government for not reducing the cocoa price despite external pressure to reduce the producer price in Ghana. Participating farmers were drawn from Wabwasi, Achimodan, Tepa, Sankori, Bremani Sukuma, among others. And Ghana has the highest rate of deforestation beating Togo and Nigeria in a league of 65 nations. This is according to a study conducted by Tropping Boss International and Nature and Development Foundation premised on illegal tree felling. Here's a report by Benjamin Edu. The report indicates Togo lost an average of 5.75% of its forest a year. From 2005 to 2010, while Nigeria posted 4% rate, with Ghana losing 2.19% of forest a year. In Ghana, trees are cut for charcoal, pasture for livestock and farms, as well as urban and industrial purposes. The cutting down of trees can be both legal and illegal, but the devastation remains the same. At a town hall meeting at Sefi Yoso in the Western North region, speakers expressed serious concerns about the state of Ghana's forest. The meeting served as an interactive platform between state institutions, private logging companies, other non-state actors and civil society organizations. They deliberated on the payment and use of timber royalties for forest fringe communities. Project coordinator at Tropenbos International Ghana, Daniel Kofiabu said the rate of the deforestation in the country need to stop immediately. Today's meeting is to afford communities the opportunity to interact with these duty bearers and to tell these community persons how revenues have been used in the past. And this gives communities confidence to be able to safeguard the remaining forests that we have. Capacity building expert with Nature and Development Foundation, Abna Wood, underscored the need to provide more information on the disbursement and utilization of revenues received from logging companies and other sources. Some communities have started benefiting from SRA, which is something they had never had before. Now, on illegal logging, um, reports coming in indicate that since the monitors were taken through the technological advancement of raising forest alerts on infractions, there is about a reduced fraction of illegal logging activities in the forest. Deputy Director of Forest Service Division at Sefi Yosu Municipality, Vicent Apia, said the country is effectively utilizing forest resources. Nature and Development Foundation, NDF, with funds from the European Union, is implementing a project titled Strengthening the Capacity of Non-State Actors to Improve Flecked and Red Plus Processes in West Africa. This EU NSA project is implemented with Troponbos, Ghana, in high forest zones in Ghana. In other news, people in authority have been urged to give equal opportunities to women who qualify to take up leadership positions in society at a program to promote gender equality. Speakers pushed for the participation of women in decision-making processes at all levels. 
Many girls are able to voice their feelings and demonstrate a strong sense of self-confidence. According to CARE, adolescence is a time of psychological risk and heightened vulnerability for girls. This notwithstanding, many girls are unable to take up leadership positions when they grow up owing to low self-esteem, lack of opportunities and low self-confidence. It is in this light that 59 girls in leadership positions from the St. John Senior High School, Amasaman Senior High School, and other junior high schools in the Ganoth municipality are to benefit from a mentorship and transformational training. TV3 News anchor and UNICEF menstrual ambassador Wendy Lai, who advised the girls on menstrual hygiene, also mentored them on taking up leadership roles. The girls' governance camp organized by Leading Ladies Network offered me the opportunity to share my experience with about 59 young ladies. We spoke about leadership and social development. We also spoke about a very critical topic which has become a global concern and that is menstruation. Some students received sanitary parts. Administrator of Leading Ladies Network, Felicia Mensa, urged Ghanaians to support girls who take up leadership roles. One of the sessions we had was start to build confidence and realize that menstrual health, especially when they are in their menses, and some of them, it affects their confidence. Kudos to Wendy for that initiative. Then check out for more updates and breaking news events on 3news.com. I am Issa Mone. And I am Portia Gabo.